So, you're on a path to becoming a BCBA or you're already a newly minted BCBA and you want to know what is the secret sauce that makes you exceptional, that makes you stand out as a BCBA. Well, today we have you covered. That's what we're going to talk about during this video. Hi, I'm Dom, the BCBA mom, and welcome back to my channel. I'm going to tell you seven things you need to know to not just become a BCBA, but to be a good BCBA with exceptional qualities that stand out in the field. But before we get started, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, and please comment down below. Let's get into it. Number one, experience. Sometimes you just need time in the game. Have you ever had that BCBA who felt like a walking encyclopedia of ABA knowledge? They just knew all the answers to all the questions. They just knew how to advocate for their client. They, they knew to use the most um, effective, least restrictive intervention. They just knew, they, they knew the answer to the worst ethical violations. They just knew everything. That's not because they passed their BCBA exam. That's because they have experienced all of these different scenarios over and over and over again. That's why I think it's so important to not limit your experience, not just work with one population, one demographic, one side of the world, one community. Broaden your experience as much as you can so that you have as many answers to the questions that you need to serve that community and serve that population. I also noticed when I varied my experience, so I didn't just work with children, I worked with adults too. I didn't just work in the city, I worked in the suburbs. I worked with Asian families and Indian families and Latino families and I worked with the deaf and blind population. Because I had varied my experience, now I feel more confident and equipped with the answers to a lot of these ABA questions out here. So, so just don't rush. Don't rush your experience. Wherever you are in your process, whether you are getting your supervision hours, whether you are in class right now and you are waiting for your professor to walk through that door, whatever step you are in right now, don't rush that process. Take it all in, soak it all in, ask questions, get the answers, because that is only going to add to the value of your experience. All right. Number two, cultural humility. Being a good BCBA is not just about knowing all of the technical jargon. If I'm being honest with you, most of the time we don't even use the technical jargon unless we're standing in a room of other BCBAs at a conference or something. You also need an understanding of your clients on a deeper level. You need to understand their function of their behavior. You want to understand why they value certain things. You want to understand their tradition in their family. You want to understand why mom wants to work on this behavior instead of that behavior. So the more we understand the culture of the individual that we're serving, that is what leads to becoming an exceptional BCBA. Um, we can't always come in like, I'm the BCBA, I passed the exam, I know all the answers, you're going to follow my lead, you're going to follow my program. No. No. And no. Look up the word social validity, implement that into your strategies, and that will help you to become a better BCBA. It's not all about you. It's not all about the literature. It's about getting to know your client and their culture on a deeper level. You also want to individualize those experiences, right? There are cultures and there are subcultures. So you can't just say, because I've worked with one Asian family, I can generalize everything I learned to the next Asian family. That's not what I'm saying. So each time you enter someone's house, you enter someone's community, because they're interdisciplinary team, that's another opportunity to get to learn that individual. Number three. CEUs, 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 okay? I said it three times because not only does it help you to become a better BCBA, it is a requirement. We have to have 32 continuing education hours or continuing education units 
per credentialing cycle, which is every two years. I've said this in previous videos, don't wait till the end to get all of your CEUs because you could be implementing some of those skills and knowledge and resources that you learned during those trainings during your everyday practice. So once a month, take a CEU, once every two months. Continuous learning keeps you sharp and adaptable. Number four, you need total competence. People are going to expect you to be an expert in the field of applied behavior analysis, especially in your specialty. So if your specialty is working with early intervention or working in schools, working with adults or dissemination, you are going to be expected to be the expert in that area. Um, it is important for you to feel confident, but to also have confidence in your skill. In order to maintain your confidence, you can do like a self-assessment. You can monitor your own practice. You can have a peer come and review your work just to make sure that you are as competent as you think you are in an area. And if you're not, this is an opportunity to gain more confidence by learning more about that specialty, which is also one of our ethical guidelines. And don't be afraid to explore new areas of competence. I released a video a few months ago about all the things that we can do as a BCBA. If you haven't seen that already, I'm gonna link it to this video so you can watch it next. But don't limit yourself. We can apply the science to almost any setting. Number five, integrity. Okay. Um, so it is our responsibility to stick to our ethical guidelines. I think what makes you an exceptional BCBA or a BCBA that stands out is not just knowing what's right, but actually doing what's right. Um, there have been a couple of times where I had a huge business deal, but there were parts of the business deal that would violate an ethical code. There were times where I wanted to take on a client, but I couldn't because it would create a multiple role or a dual role. There were times where I wanted to say, hey, can you tell me how great of a BCBA I am so that I can put it on my website and so that I can get five stars, but that would go against my ethical guidelines. So being a good BCBA is knowing what's right and actually doing what's right. Even when it doesn't feel good, it doesn't benefit you, but just as long as it's benefiting our client. Having integrity as a BCBA is your superpower. A lot of people feel like having the BCBA, having the credentials is the superpower. Having integrity along with the credentials is your superpower. Number six. You need really great interpersonal skills. Um, and that's coming from somebody who can be a little socially awkward at times, believe it or not. Um, so interpersonal skills are so important because as a BCBA, there are gonna be several steps that you take on, that you take a family or an agency through during onboarding. You have to communicate with them during each of those steps. So now we're gonna do intake. I'm gonna do a functional behavior assessment. After that, I'm going to write a treatment plan and I have to explain to you what's gonna be in the treatment plan. I have to teach you how to implement the treatment plan. I need to get your consent. I need to, so many areas where communication and um, building relationships are important. So having great interpersonal skills are an essential quality of a good BCBA. Number six, leadership skills. I said this in a previous video, but the moment I became a BCBA, I quickly discovered that I am a leader, that I was a leader. Even though I wasn't an official supervisor or I didn't have an official team under me, people looked to me as the expert, as the leader. So I quickly had to jump into that leadership role. It helps if you are taking leadership courses, if you are taking some type of coursework or training that helps you be an effective leader. They don't teach you that in our ABA program. That is something that you should learn during your supervision or just during experience. 
Um, before I became a BCBA, I was a case manager. Um, I had a caseload of 25 clients. I had 15 staff under me. So I had a good five to six years before becoming a BCBA to work on my leadership skills. So now when it's time to take on leadership roles, like be a clinical director, or be, a, or be an approved supervisor, or apply for a adjunct faculty role at a university, you have already exemplified those leadership skills and those leadership qualities. To me, great leaders use the same in interventions that we would use with our clients, they use with their staff. Um, they use behavior skills training, they use positive reinforcement, they model the behavior that they want to see, they give feedback, they are compassionate, they are truthful, they have integrity. So the same energy you use with your client, keep that same energy in your leadership role. Um, being a leader doesn't always mean ruling with a stern fist or being the boss or being bossy or being able to tell people what to do. Delegating is a good quality of being a leader, but that is not the full scope of what a leader is. Number seven, the last skill. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just all that I have time for right now. But the seventh skill that you need in order to be an exceptional BCBA is the skill of public speaking and influence. So the success of our field relies heavily on if people know about us, if people accept us, if people hire us, if people want to work with us. Um, so we have to have the ability to speak eloquently about our field in a way that is consumable, in a way that is understandable to our audience. Spoiler alert, most of the individuals that need our services are never gonna read an article in Java they're never gonna read all of our ABA literature. They're never gonna get their hands on a Cooper book. So it is our responsibility to disseminate this information in a way that they can understand it and that they would want to use it. This is what I love about my job. I do this by speaking at my kids' career fair, speaking at local autism expos or presenting at local autism parent support groups, going on local radio and TV shows, disseminating the benefits of ABA so that I can hit those people that may not be on social media. Or speaking of social media, just disseminating on social media. This is why I started my YouTube channel. This is why I started doing Instagram reels and TikToks and all of the things because I knew that the people that I wanted to serve were, were less likely to read about ABA in an article and they were more likely to flip through their phone and get some consumable, entertaining, um, and educational information from me. So that's why I continue to do that so that I can reach a population that may not have access to this information. If you see that someone is having a mental health summit and they don't have a speaker on ABA, invite yourself out to that presentation and say and ask if you can present on ABA because a lot of people are more familiar with some of the traditional therapies, but they may not know about ABA until you tell them. I've done talks at my local library. I've done free talks at a non-for-profit for teen mothers. Create a resource pamphlet for your local library, for your child's school. Whatever you need to do to get the word out there, that is what's going to make you stand out as a influencer, as someone who can persuade, not coerce, but persuade you that this is a service that you should take advantage of. This is a science that you should learn more about. And I am the expert to teach you. Write articles for mental health magazines, more popular autism magazines, parenting magazines, teacher magazines, just anything outside of our normal scope. And lastly, when you are building these relationships, um, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Don't be afraid to be honest. I often talk about 
the fact that I am an autism mom and a BCBA, and it seems to be comforting to a lot of the parents that I work with because they know that I see it from their perspective, and then I also see it one who is there to carry out a service. So it's okay to share your personal experiences. It's okay to share why you got into the field. It's okay to share um, some success stories that you've had with clients over the years. Um, obviously omitting any personal information, but it's okay to be vulnerable. And that is what's going to allow people to like you, trust you, and work with you. Okay, so that is all that I have time for now. Hopefully you really enjoyed the seven skills that you need to be an exceptional BCBA. If you wanna to add to the list, feel free to comment down below. I would love for this list to keep growing and growing um, so that we can keep sharing um, information with the next generation, guys. Um, please don't forget to like this video if you got anything from the content. And don't forget to subscribe. I'm gonna need you to hit that subscribe button. Can you do that for me? Thank you. Okay, so that's all that I have time for, and I'll see you on the next one. Bye.